I've been at Google for 16 years. Um, the last six years, I've been in life sciences and healthcare. I, I generally like running more interactive classes. Um, given the size of the group, we thought polls might work. So I'll launch a couple of polls throughout the talk, and I'll try and keep an eye on the chat as well if you guys have questions. But um, I'll, I might save them for the end as well. Uh, so let me talk through the agenda a little bit. Um, I'm hoping to give you uh, uh, some information about AI, in particular um, deep learning and healthcare. And um, I will be in using AI and deep learning interchangeably because that's just the name of our team is Google AI. Um, but the examples you'll be seeing are all deep learning examples. Um, and uh, as you know, AI does include other things like robotics and non-neural network approaches. So um, I just wanted to be clear that uh, when I use them, I don't mean to be conflating them entirely. Uh, once I cover what some of the key applications are for uh, what we've done in AI and healthcare, I'd like to discuss with you what the kind of unique opportunity I think we have because of deep learning to be able to uh, uh, create a much more equitable society while we're deploying AI models. Um, and we can talk about how that's possible. Uh, and finally, I'll touch on one last set of applications for AI and healthcare at the end here. So uh, on the, in terms of uh, uh, the history behind AI and healthcare, we are benefiting from the uh, fact that we have uh, the maturation of deep learning um, and especially the end-to-end -end, uh, capabilities where we can learn directly from the raw data. Um, this is extremely useful for advances in computer vision and speech recognition, which is highly valuable in the field of medical. Uh, the other area, as you all know, is the um, increase in localized compute power via GPUs. Um, so that's allowed for neural networks to outperform uh, non-neural networks um, uh, in the past. And then the third is the value of all these open source, large label data sets, ImageNet being one for non-health related areas, but there is uh, uh, public data sets like UK Biobank and even um, Mimic, which has been truly helpful. And it's uh, was developed actually um, and produced at the MIT labs. So uh, you'll be hearing about some of the applications of AI in healthcare next. Uh, one of the things that we do is to make sure we look at uh, the needs in the industry and match that up to the tech capabilities. Healthcare specifically has enormous amounts of complex data sets. Uh, annually, it's estimated to be generating on the order of several thousand exabytes of healthcare data a year. Um, just to put that in perspective a bit, uh, it's estimated that if you were to take the internet data, um, that's around something with more like hundreds of exabytes. Uh, so it's, it's several thousand times more. Um, and what we're looking at in terms of uh, those applications you'll see in a bit is the pattern detection um, and the ability to recognize for things like lesions and uh, tumors and um, really nuanced uh, subtle imagery. Another area that it's useful for is just the uh, addressing the limited medical expertise globally. Uh, if you look to the right, what you'd like to see is uh, one medical specialist, like a radiologist, to about 12,000 people in the population. Uh, and what you can see on the graph to the right is that uh, in developing countries, it looks more like one to 100,000 or one to a million even. And so the benefit of AI and healthcare is that it can help scale up to running some of these complex tax tasks that are valuable that medical experts are capable of. The third is uh, really addressing human inconsistencies, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, this, especially when we're talking about generating labels. Um, AI models don't obviously suffer from recency or cognitive biases, um, and they are also able to work tirelessly, which is an issue um, when, when you have to work overtime, uh, as in the medical field, which often happens. But let me just talk a little bit through the next application, which is lung cancer. Uh, the what we developed was a computer-aided diagnostic, uh, and in this case, it was to help screen uh, for lung cancer using low-dose CT scans. Um, what you normally see um, is the survival rates uh, increasing dramatically if you catch it at earlier stages, but about 80% of lung cancers are not caught early. Um, and uh, uh, what they use usually to do these screenings are these 
uh, low dose CT scans that if you look in this diagram to the right is these three dimensional uh, imaging that happens through your entire body. It creates hundreds of images for the radiologist to look through. Um, and uh, typically the actual um, uh, lung cancer signs are very subtle. So what our models were able to do um, when we looked at this was to actually not just outperform the state of the art, uh, but actually more importantly, we compared it to the radiologist to see if there was an absolute reduction of both false positives uh, and false negatives. So false positives will lead to overutilization of the system and false negatives will lead to uh, not being able to catch the cancer early enough. And usually you want to see both, re both reduced. Pathology is another area that's a, a hard deep learning problem um, and even more complex data. This is uh, on the left, you can see um, when you take a biopsy, you have slices of the body tissue um, and these are magnified up to 40 times um, and creates about 10 to 15 gigapixels of information per slide. Um, the part that is inherently complex is when you're doing pathology, you want to know both the uh, uh, magnified uh, level, highly magnified level of this tissue so that you can characterize the lesion. And you also need to uh, understand um, the overall tissue architecture to provide context for it. Um, and so that's at a lower power. So you have a multi-scale problem. Um, and it is also um, inherently complex uh, to be able to differentiate between benign and malignant tumors. Uh, there's hundreds of the different pathologies that can affect the tissue. And so being able to visually differentiate is very challenging. Um, we built the model um, to detect breast cancer from uh, um, uh, pathology images. Um, and the pathologists actually um, had no false positives. Uh, the model was able to capture more of the cancer lesion. So it was greater than 95% compared to 73% that pathologists were getting. But it also increased the number of false positives. Um, this meant that what we tried uh, then was to actually combine uh, and have the model and pathologists work together um, to see if the accuracy could improve, and it, it absolutely did. Um, and uh, this com combined effort led to also development of an augmented microscope where you can see the model um, uh, detecting the patches inside the Microsoft microscope view itself. Um, and we'll come back to the fact that the models uh, had certain weaknesses and how we dealt with that later. Uh, genomics is another area that's uh, benefited significantly from uh, deep learning. Um, it's worth noting that uh, when you do um, whole genome sequences, what you're, you're doing is tearing up your um, DNA into a billion reads of about 100 bases. Um, and there's about a 30x oversampling with errors when you do that. Um, when you try and uh, figure out the sequence, what you're trying to do is something like uh, take 30 years of a Sunday newspaper, 30 copies each with errors introduced, and then shred them into 20 word snippets, and then you try and put them back together. Uh, that's essentially what's happening when you're doing your sequencing. Um, and so we recast this problem as a deep learning problem. Uh, we uh, looked at how image recognition um, and specifically the convolutional neural networks would be able to perform um, in this space and uh, developed a tool called Deep Variant, which is open sourced and um, available for, uh, for anyone to use. Uh, and we've been improving it over time. This is uh, proven to be uh, highly accurate. Um, the US FDA runs a precision FDA competition every few years and it's uh, outperformed uh, most and won the awards for um, three out of four accuracy areas. And you can see on the right that when you, it's quite visually obvious when you actually get a, a error, a false variant in the sequencing. Um, so this was a clever way to actually be able to uh, rapidly detect errors in, in variant calls. So we talked about the different needs that um, are in the medical field and one of them was um, the limited medical expertise. There's one way to help them, which is scaling up the tasks that they run so that they can be automated. This is another way of addressing it, which is returning time to the doctors. What's happened is what you're seeing on, in this picture is a girl who drew um, her experience when visiting a doctor. You can see the doctor is actually facing the computer to the left. Um, this sparked a lot of discussion within the healthcare 
uh, industry about the cost of technology um, and how it's interfering with patient care. Um, the doctors now at this point spend something on the order of six hours a day interacting with their electronic health records to get data entered. Um, one of the areas that's ripe for being able to support um, uh, medical doctors is uh, uh, scribes, human scribes have been deployed. Medical dictation has uh, gotten a much better. The automatic speech recognitions now have end-to-end -end models that are highly accurate. Um, and uh, it's improved significantly also on natural language processing. So these are all ways that um, is more like an assistive kind of AI um, to help doctors relieve the burden of documentation from them. Uh, I'm gonna launch the uh, poll right now just to see what people think is the most valuable application. Um, let me see here if I can do that. And as I, just to quickly recap there was, um, uh, computer diagnostics, which are useful for screening and diagnoses. Um, there is, and that was with, demonstrated with the radiology. Um, there was proved prognosis. Um, that's pathology is useful for um, determining therapeutics, um, being able to determine treatment efficacy and, and the progression of the disease. Um, and that's what both pathology and genomics is highly utilized for. And then returning time to experts is, is really the AI assistance through medical dictation scribing. Okay, great. So let me just keep going while the poll is going. Um, uh, I want to talk about how you can actually um, achieve a greater moonshot. So let me take a step back here where um, uh, we look at how the healthcare, the world of healthcare looks right now. It's tremendously filled with um, fragmentation. It's fairly impersonal and it's uh, inequitably distributed. Um, and uh, one of the things I noted was that uh, in tech, um, we do amplify uh, a system if you apply it to it. So tech is, is uh, a way to both augment and scale up what exists. Um, and so if you have, if you're applying it to a broken system with perverse incentives, it won't fix the system inherently, it will accelerate it. Um, but at the core of machine learning um, and uh, these deep learning technologies, what we're doing is uh, we're looking at the data very carefully and uh, utilizing that to, to build predictions and, um, and uh, determine uh, outcomes. In this case, um, given that the world is not full of equity, um, you, you run the risk of training the wrong models. We published also a paper to help um, address this. So societal inequities and biases are often codified in the data that we're using. Um, we actually have the opportunity to examine those historical biases and proactively promote a more equitable future um, when we're developing the models. Uh, you can do that by correcting for bias in the training data. Um, you can also uh, uh, correct bias in the model design and uh, the problem formulation, which the uh, and what you're trying to solve for. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and, and finally, if, if none of that is applicable, then you, all, you can also test and ensure for equal outcomes and resource allocations at the end of when you're deploying the AI models. So this is, um, I used to work in uh, Google X, um, which is uh, an, Google's effort to do moonshots. The way we define moonshots is the intersection of a huge problem, breakthrough technology, and radical solutions. Um, and uh, a huge problem here is that the world is uh, uncertain, impersonal, and it's also needs higher accuracy. Um, we have the benefit of a breakthrough tech right now, which is AI and deep learning. Um, and I'm just going to say digital mobile tools is actually breakthrough tech for healthcare because uh, they tend to lag about a decade behind other industries due to regulations, safety, privacy, and quality needs. Um, and so a radical solution here is, is we, we actually think about not just improving the quality of care that we're delivering, but making sure that when we do that, we also make it more equitable. Um, and uh, there's, at every point in time when I see a technological wave happen, um, I do realize that at this point that it's an opportunity for us to reshape our future. So in the case of um, deep learning, uh, I'd like to talk about the opportunities for actually moving. Um, sorry, I didn't realize the slides weren't advancing. Um, I want to talk about the opportunity to actually make the AI models much more um, equitable and how we would do that. 
So the two key areas I'll talk about is community participation um, and how that's going to affect the models and in, in the data evaluation. Um, and then also planning for model limitations and how you can do that effectively with AI. One of the things that we did was work with the uh, regions that we were directly going to um, deploy the models with. And so on the left here, you see us working with um, the team in India. Um, and on the right, it's our team working with those in, in Thailand. Uh, what we found was that the socioeconomic um, situation absolutely mattered in terms of where you would deploy the model. Um, an example is while we developed the model um, with uh, the ophthalmology um, centers, and that's where the eye disease is happening and diabetic neuropathy is the leading cause of growing cause of blindness um, in the world. Uh, this is where the models were developed, but actually the, the use case was most acute in uh, the diabetic centers, so the endocrinology offices. Um, and people were not making the 100 meter uh, distance to be able to go from the endocrinology offices to the ophthalmology offices um, because of access issues and uh, challenges with um, with lines and, and and so on and so forth. So, so this is an area that we explore, uh, explored using user research extensively to make sure that um, we thought through where the AI models would land and how that would impact the users. Another area uh, that we looked at is um, when we're generating labels for the models. Um, you can see on the left that as Classically, you, you would expect when you get more data, um, the models continues to improve. So it kind of flattens out here at 60,000 images. Um, and, and at some point, that's sufficient and you're not going to get much more improvement from that. Um, what you actually benefit from, if you look to the right graph, is improvement of the, what we, the quality of the labels or the, what, we, what we refer to as the grades on the images. Um, each doctor gives an image and grade, which is their diagnostic opinion of, of what they think they're seeing. Um, as we got multiple opinions on single images and were able to reconcile that, we were able to continuously improve the model output um, and improve the accuracy. So this is the, um, uh, something that's often said in the healthcare spaces. If you ask three do doctors, you get four opinions because um, even the doctor themselves may not be consistent with themselves over time. Uh, the way that this is addressed um, in some countries is to use the Delphi method, which is which was developed during the Cold War. Uh, it helps uh, determine consensus where individual opinions vary. And we developed a tool to do asynchronous adjudication of different opinions. Um, this has led to much higher ground truth uh, uh, data creation and, and it's because of the fact that doctors actually sometimes just miss what what another doctor notices. And so they generally do reconcile um, and are able to come to agreement on what the actual um, uh, severity or diagnosis should be. Um, and so this was something that we saw uh, really, that was really impactful because um, when we were doing the analysis with ophthalmologists, we would see things like 60% consistency across the doctors. Um, and this was a, a way to actually address that level of variance. And, and here's the last area um, that I want to talk about for community engagement. Um, this is around, if you go even further upstream to the problem formulation, this is a case where they didn't think through uh, the inputs to their models and algorithms. Um, this algorithm was uh, trying to determine the um, utilization needs of the community. And they were using the um, uh, health costs as a proxy for the actual health needs. Um, this has led to uh, um, uh, an inadvertently a racial bias because less money was spent on black patients. And, um, and this was caught after the fact. And so if you just click one more time, um, this is this is one of the key areas where um, having input from the community uh, would have actually caught that much earlier on when they were doing the algorithm development. This is something that we practice now frequently. Um, and I know you guys are working on projects, so uh, it'd be uh, one of the polls I wanted to put out there was just, let me see if we can get it to launch, 
is uh, which one of these um, uh, approaches are actually potentially relevant at all for um, the projects that you guys are working on. Okay, great. So I'll keep going with the talk then while this is being saved and be nice to look back on it. I, on the left here, um, I mentioned earlier how our pathology models um, had certain weaknesses um, in terms of uh, false positives, um, but it also was capturing more of the um, cancer lesions than the pathologists were. So we developed um, a way to try to explain the models um, through similar image lookup. And uh, what this has allowed to have happen was um, uh, it, show, it uses a cluster algorithm and is able to find features that were not known um, uh, as uh, before to pathologists that might be meaningful indicators of the actual uh, uh, diagnosis or prognosis. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, pathologists have started to use the tool to learn from it. And, um, and there's also the benefit of the pathologist being able to recognize any issues with the models and inform the models to improve. So you get a virtuous cycle of uh, the models and the pathologist learning from each other. On the right uh, is another way that we uh, use to explain the model output. We use sali saliency maps, um, which is a way to just um, be able to identify which features are um, uh, the model is actually paying attention to, and in this case, which pixels um, the model is paying attention to and, and light those up. We do this so that we know that the, um, uh, the way that the model is actually determining the, uh, the, the diagnostic, whether it's um, a particular skin condition, um, uh, that they're looking at the actual skin abnormalities and not some uh, side um, potential cor um, unintentional correlation to skin tone or, or demographic information. Um, and so this has been valuable to you as a way of checking the models that way. Um, and the last that I mentioned is, is doing model, ev model evaluation for equal outcomes. Um, there's something in, it for, in the dermatology space known as the Fitzpatrick skin type. It allows you to see the different skin tones. And what we do is to have test sets that are in the different skin tones to do the uh, model evaluation to see if we do get equal outcomes. And this is something where, as the model developer and you have to make some hard choices. If you see that your models aren't performing well uh, for a particular um, category or demographic, uh, ideally what happens is you supplement your data set so that you can um, imp improve your models further to appropriately address those regions, or you may have to make um, a decision to limit your model um, output so that there can be equal outcomes. Um, and sometimes you don't actually choose not to um, deploy the models. And so these are some of the kind of real world implications of developing AI models in the healthcare space. The last application I wanted to talk through with this group is um, uh, the concept of healthcare. Typically in the past, healthcare is um, uh, thought of for patients. And while every patient is a person, not every person is a patient. And um, uh, patients typically are considered on the left here, people who are sick or at risk. Um, they're entering the healthcare system. Uh, the models are quite different when you're thinking about uh, people of this nature, whether they have acute or chronic diseases. Um, and they're the ones that we talked about a bit earlier, which are screening, diagnostics, prognosis, treatment. Those are what the models tend to focus on. Um, if you're looking at people, uh, they are considered quote unquote well, um, but their health is impacted every single day by what we call like social determinants of health, which are your environmental and social circumstances, your behavioral and lifestyle uh, choices, um, and uh, how your genes are interacting with the environment. And um, the models here look dramatically different in terms of how you would approach the problem. Uh, they tend to focus on preventative care, uh, so eating well, sleeping well, um, exercising. And they also focus on public health, which I think uh, has been a big um, known issue now with uh, coronavirus. Um, and, and of course, screening is actually consistent across both sides. 
So um, when we talk about uh, public health, there can be things like epidemiological models, um, which are extremely valuable, um, but there's also um, uh, you know, things that are happening right now, uh, especially probably one of the biggest global threats to public health is uh, climate change. Um, and so uh, one of the things that's happening in places like India is flood forecasting uh, for public health alerts. In, in India, there's a lot of alert fatigue actually. And so it's, it's actually unclear when they should care about the alerts or not. Um, what this team did was they focused on building a scalable high resolution hydraulic model using convolutional neural nets to estimate inputs like snow levels, soil moisture estimation and permeability. Um, these hydraulic models uh, simulates the water behavior across floodplains um, and were high, far more accurate than what was being used before. Um, and this has uh, been deployed now to help with alerting in, across the India regions for during the monsoon seasons. Um, let's see. And so I just want to leave this group with, with the idea that uh, uh, on the climate change side, there is a lot going on right now. Um, nature is uh, essential to the health of the plant, but also the people that live on it. So uh, we currently rely on these ecosystem services. Um, and what that means is people uh, rely on things like clean air, water supply, pollination of agriculture for food, land stability and climate regulations. And this is an area that's ripe for AI to be able to help understand far better and value those services um, that we currently don't pay a lot for, um, but we'll probably have to in the future. And so this last um, slide, let me see if we can get it to appear, um, is for the poll. Um, and just, I wanted to compare uh, and understand if the perception around health is any different um, in terms of what might be the most exciting for uh, AI to be applied to. Thanks for launching the final poll. And, that, and the last thing I want to leave the group with is uh, none of the work that we do in AI and healthcare is possible. There's a huge team um, and a lot of collaboration that happens across academic medical research uh, organizations and um, research institutes and healthcare systems. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, this is our team as it's grown over the years and um, in different forms. It's not all of our team even anymore, but this is certainly where a lot of the work has been um, generated from. And let me take a look at the questions in chat now. And so the, I'll just recap what the poll results were. So it looks like um, the diagnostic models um, uh, 54, hmm. Oh, yeah, so I guess you guys can do multiple choice. Uh, you can pick multiple ones. So 50, about 60 people, half the people um, felt that the diagnostics and the therapeutics were valuable um, and less interested in, but still valuable, the assistance. Thanks for filling those out. Um, definitely, let me look at the questions. Given the fast advancement in terms of new models, what is the main bottleneck to scaling ML diagnostic solutions to more people around the world. Uh, it's the regulatory um, automation of meeting the regulatory needs. Um, the long pull uh, for diagnostics is um, ensuring patient safety, um, proper regulation. Usually you go through FDA, RC marks, um, and that can take uh, uh, time. There's quality management systems that have to be built to make sure that uh, the system is robust um, from a development perspective. So it's software as a medical device. Um, and this is uh, always gonna be true in the case of when you're dealing with patients. Um, in terms of the other part maybe is the open source um, data sets, um, having more labeled data sets out there so that uh, everyone can have access and move that space forward uh, is, is valuable. Second question here. Good data sets are essential to developing useful equitable models. What efforts and technologies do we need to invest in to continue collecting data sets and form our models? Uh, so 
one of the things that's happening is uh, developing uh, scalable labeling infrastructure. Um, that's that's one way to be able to um, generate better data sets. Um, but raw data is also um, ones that are directly um, reflecting the outcomes is valuable. So um, an example is if you're thinking about uh, um, data that's coming straight from the user in terms of their uh, vital signs or their um, physiological signals. Um, these are things that uh, are as close to ground truth as you can get about um, the in individual's well-being. And, um, and obviously, uh, what we saw with COVID-19 was it was even harder to get information like um, how many deaths were actually happening um, and what were the causes of those deaths. And so these are the kinds of data sets that need to, um, these pipelines need to be thought of in the context of how can they be supporting public health goods and, and how does that data accurately get out the door. So we do have an effort right now that um, lots of people pulled into, especially for coronavirus, which was um, uh, on GitHub now, which I can provide a link for later. Um, and it's volunteers um, who have built a, a transparent data pipeline uh, for the source of the data. Provenance is very important to keep track of when you create these data sets to make sure uh, you know where what what the purpose of the data is and um, who's how reliable it is and where the source is coming from. So these are the kinds of things that need to be built out to inform the models that you build. This last question, how do you facilitate conversation awareness around potential algorithmic bias related to the products you are developing? Um, several things. Um, one is that uh, the team you build, um, as much as of them that can be reflective of uh, the be representative of a pop broader population is actually more meaningful than, than I think people realize. Um, there's, so what I mean by that is if you have a diverse team working on it or you bring in people who uh, can be contributors or um, part of a consortium that can reflect on the problem space that you're trying to tackle, that is actually um, a really good way to hear and discover things that you might not have ever thought of before. Um, but again, it can start with the team that you build and then the um, network around you that you are uh, actually getting feedback loops from. And the, you know, if you can't afford it, uh, you, you would want to do that in a way that is quite measurable and quantitative. But if you can't, it's, it's actually still quite meaningful to, um, to proactively just have these conversations about what space you're going into and how you're going to think about the inputs to your models. Um, all right, so thank you. Uh, it looks like those yeah. were the majority of the questions.